I'm reading from Genesis chapter 22 this morning, Genesis 22 and verses 1 to 18. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire, for a burnt offering, and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told his servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered and they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh Yaira, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants by number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies, and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. Have you ever heard of Veggie Tales? Veggie Tales was a series that came out when my kids were young, and uh, the animation was amazing. I remember picking up first the VHS tapes and then the DVDs in the Christian bookstore, but later you were able to buy them in Walmart and Target and all over the place because they were so well done that everybody wanted to watch them. They were entertaining, the scripts were well written, the stories were well told, and uh, it was just visually appealing. And so it had a great market and it had a great ministry. In fact, it, they were so well done that the technology was sought after by large uh, studios who wanted to buy the rights to how he made this, these characters. And uh, they wanted to buy it so that they could make their own videos instead. But Phil Vischer hung on to the technology because he was so committed to the mission that he had felt God had given him to share and to counter the values that kids were gaining from watching MTV and values from TV and other sources that really conflicted with the Christian faith. He felt that God had given him this platform to share great stories from the Bible to impact children around the world. And so in his, in his book, Me, Myself, and Bob, he chronicles some of how that came to be. I'd just like to read you a short portion from his, the introduction to this book. Phil writes, I had a dream. I wanted my stories to make the world a better place. I wanted to build the next Disney, be the next Disney. And as of September 26, 2002, Everything appeared to be working perfectly. 
I had led the team that created and launched VeggieTales, the most successful direct-to-video series in history. I had built the largest animation studio between the coasts. And that night found me standing in front of a cheering throng at the premiere of our first animated feature film, choking back tears as I stared out at the happy faces of hundreds of friends and coworkers. They weren't tears of joy. Unlike most of the artists and animators in the room that night, I knew just how deceiving appearances can be. I knew that more than half of them would lose their jobs the very next day. I knew that the company and ministry I had built in 12 years of often exasperating work was on the verge of disintegrating, collapsing right before my eyes. Most perplexing, I knew that God knew it too. He knew about the financial crisis and the impending layoff of so many good people. He knew about the looming death of his work that had benefited so many families around the world, that had inspired hundreds of young Christian filmmakers and earned kudos from skeptics of Christian art like, the Time, like Time Magazine and the New York Times. He knew how hard we had worked. He knew how far we had come. And it appeared from where I sat that he was going to do nothing to help us. Phil goes on to tell his story of of how he had this dream that God was going to use everything he was doing. And so he made choices that chose God and the plan he felt God had for him over cashing in and making lots of money, over selling out his studio and moving on to something else. And so having made the choices he felt God was leading him to make, and building the studio and growing it and reinvesting the money and growing the studio faster and faster, he really felt this was his mission. And when they made the Jonah movie and it was gonna be in theaters, everybody in the Christian world was excited for him getting this new platform and this new opportunity to teach kids who would just go to an animated movie what it was to believe in God and the Bible. And yet, he finds that the dream completely falls apart. And because of the financial challenges they faced, right on the cusp of their greatest uh, accomplishment, it seemed, they had to fold. And he lost the business. And uh, it continued on, but never quite the same as when he owned it and was able to make those decisions. So what happened? What is that? Why is that a good story for me to tell you? How does that inspire us to live for God and, and to do, attempt great things for him? Well, it seems that Abraham had a dream. And we know from reading the story in the Bible that the story, the, the dream that Abraham had was given to him by God. It was God's plan that he would become a great nation. It was God's plan to lead him out of his home in Ur and uh, to take him to the promised land and to give him a new place to live and a new future and a, a, a whole host of, of descendants. And Abraham had to wait and he kept get needing to be reminded by God that God was going to do this. And finally, at a hundred years old, last week we learned in the story that God had finally made good on the promise. And he'd given him a son, little Isaac, and, and now Isaac is going to grow up. And God was still going to bless his other son, Ishmael, but this was the son that God had promised. That he was the son of the promise. And so Abraham held that little boy and loved him and knew that God was going to do great things through him. And then God comes to him and gives him this test. He says to Abraham, take the boy, take your son, your only son, whom you love. God knew exactly what he was asking. And he said, take him to the place I'll show you and sacrifice him. And some people would understandably say, what kind of God would do that? What kind of God would ask him to do it? And, and even if God didn't mean it, why would he ask the man to do it? And let him think all the way up that path that his son was going to be sacrificed, that he was going to have to raise a knife and sacrifice his son. What kind of God would ask something of a man like that? 
And what was it about Abraham that allowed him to go along with that plan? Is that something that we find admirable or maybe not so much? Even if God didn't uh, mean to follow through on it, was it a good thing that Abraham said yes? Well, we've been talking about impossible circumstances and impossible situations that we get ourselves into or happen to us in life and how we deal with that and how we gain inspiration from Abraham's story. But this morning, we're looking at a different situation, not a situation where trouble comes because of our sins or the sins of people around us, not because we make bad choices or because people in the world are coming after us, but specifically because God puts us in an impossible situation. He doesn't just allow it to happen. He steers our path directly towards the trouble. And what basis does Abraham have to trust a God who would ask such a thing? I think that's a legitimate question. Whether that situation is the death of the dream that Phil Vischer had for Veggie Tales, um, or for us, a dearly loved person in our lives who is uh, who God takes from us too early, how do we deal with situations? that we know God has complete control over. And in fact, we ourselves have been following exactly what he told us to do. And it's not in spite of it, it's because we've obeyed him that we get into these situations and we're led into trouble and everything falls apart and we lose the dreams that we felt God gave us, that he was leading us down. Losses that we feel he easily could have prevented when we seek his direction and we get the opposite of a happily ever after, specifically because we were obedient to him. I think of Jim Elliott, who felt called to help evangelize the Hurani people in Ecuador. People who didn't know the name of Jesus. And, and Jim decided that he knew that was where God was taking him and that's what God wanted for him. And so he and four of his friends uh, traveled to Ecuador and they they gradually dropped uh, air dropped gifts to this tribe, this remote tribe, and and they built a camp just outside of their camp and and watched from afar and allowed some of them to come visit them, and uh, tried to build relationship with them upon which they could later share the gospel and tell them about Jesus, and Jim felt like the other four felt that God was calling them to do this. He'd laid on their hearts these people who did not know him. But just as they were getting ready to travel into the village and share the gospel, they were visited by 10 tribesmen warriors who murdered all five of them. Jim had left his young wife and his young baby behind to travel there. And now he and his comrades were all dead. How is it that that could be God's will? How is it that could be God's plan? And yet, Jim Elliott had written some time before, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. But we might ask, why trust God? What made Abraham trust God? Is it something that might help us in our struggle to trust God too? Are there things in our lives we find it hard to give over to them? Things that we're, where we feel we've been obedient and then they haven't come to successful conclusion. And so we wonder, did we mishear the voice of God or, or did he say something? And is there a reason that this has all gone wrong even though we thought we were doing the right thing? Well, if we look at the story of Abraham, we can read through this passage and other passages in the Old Testament and understand possibly some of what might have happened and some of why Abraham chose to trust this God. In Deuteronomy 12, 31, it says, you must not worship the Lord your God in this way, in their way, speaking about the other nations, because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in fire as sacrifices to their gods. Now, that was only one 
of many times in the Old Testament when it condemns ritual sacrifice of children to other gods or anyone. And it specifically says that God would never ask them to do that. That's not something that God uh, wants people to do in order to worship him. So if God would never, if that's the character that he has, why did he ask Abraham to do it? And what happened here? Why would Abraham trust him? And why is that a good thing? Well, this passage in Deuteronomy comes long after Abraham's time. And it, it, so it, it's not that Abraham would have heard those teachings and known that from that source, that God wouldn't do this. But somehow Abraham knew this God and he knew the character of the God he was following. So even his son, whom he dearly loved, and he'd waited so long to have this fulfillment of God's promise to him, he was willing to follow God's instructions, believing it would work out. And there's a clue in our story to the fact that he felt that way. Because when it gets to the third day of their journey, Abraham's traveling with his servants and with his son Isaac, and, and they've got wood for a sacrifice, and they've got the fire, and they've got everything to do the sacrifice. And Abraham spots the, the spot that he knows God wants to take him to, to do the sacrifice. And he says to the servants, you stay here. So he says, stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little further. And did you pick it up the first time? He says, we will worship there, and then we will come right back. He says to his servants, we're going to, we, me and Isaac, are going to go do this sacrifice, and then we, me and Isaac, are going to come back here and rejoin you to travel home. He somehow knew and believed that, Abra that Isaac would get through this situation unscathed, that he would take his son home with him. Now, some could maybe say that they think maybe Abraham was lying, but there's another clue in the text. As we look through the story a little further, as they start traveling towards the spot, Isaac looks up at his father and he says, Father, we don't have a sacrifice. Like, we've got wood and we've got fire and, and we're ready to do this, except we don't have a sacrifice. And Abraham says, God will provide the sacrifice. He's not bamboozling his son. He believes that he is there to sacrifice and that God will not take his son from him. That somehow God will make this situation so that he can worship him the way that God prescribes and yet his son will be safe. And so he does what God tells him, not knowing how it can possibly work that he can take his son home with him. But he seems to believe he's going to walk away with his son and rejoin the servants and go home safe and sound. See, Abraham had gotten to know this God, and he'd seen him in action, and he'd watched him rescue over and over again. He'd seen his patient rescuing of him and using him to patiently rescue Lot, and he'd seen how God had forgiven him for the way that he'd kind of sold things out with Sarah and uh, had rescued her anyway and put him back in Abraham's care and and got them away from that situation safely, God had always, always come through for him. He had led him, and he had made good on every promise, and he had told him, Isaac will be the son through whom you will have many descendants. So Isaac could not die and stay dead and then have children later. He's just a young man right now. He has no kids. So if the promise is going to be fulfilled then Isaac has to be safe. So Abraham knows that somehow Abra he and his son will be fine because God's promise is always sure. And every time he had come to doubt it, God had reassured him. And now God had given him a son. And he knew this God that could do miraculous things would not allow the promise to go unfulfilled. So he trusted not in the details of the plan, but in the God who laid the plan out. He didn't know what was going to happen next, but he knew the God who would do, make the next move and would lead him down a path that would lead to good things for him 
and for his family and for his son Isaac. And you and I, when things get rough and even when we feel like we've been obedient and yet things have gone horribly wrong or we haven't encountered the success in, uh, in our ministry within the church or the things we do, it doesn't matter. If we are faithful to God, God will bless us eventually. And we can trust that he has a good plan, even when it doesn't look like it's working out very well. We can trust him, not because we know what he'll do next or can anticipate his moves, but because we know his character and the kind of God he is and that he's good to his word. And he has promised us that he would provide for us and that all things work together for good to them that love God. So if you love God, you can know that things will work out for your good. Let's pray this morning. God, I thank you that you are the kind of God that we can trust in. We realize that sometimes we become jaded and we want to see the answers before we're willing to commit to a plan with anyone else because we find that even the best among us are sometimes a little untrustworthy, that sometimes we fail each other. And uh, even not meaning to, we let each other down. And yet we know that none of us can claim to have seen you let them down ultimately. That you are a great God who loves us and uh, holds good things in store for us. So even when things seem dire, even when it seems like we've done the right thing and gotten exactly the wrong result, we can trust you with that. That things will still have an opportunity to play out even when we can't see the ending. Help us to trust like Abraham did, to put everything, including our children, in your hands, knowing that you are a good God who always keeps his promises and loves all of his creation. We trust you because we can see your love, especially in Jesus. And we can know that you love us beyond our ability to even comprehend. Help us to trust you this week with every decision we make and every path we walk down. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.